Martin Weiss. I'm Associate Director for the Center of Governance and Markets, and I'm also a professor in the University of Pittsburgh School of Computing and Information. The mission of the Center for Governance and Markets is to understand the diverse institutions and governance arrangements that affect social order and human well-being in the United States and around the world. We generate knowledge in ways, of ways in which individuals and communities overcome challenges to living free, prosperous, and peaceful lives. The Center is a hub of a global network of researchers and practitioners in the areas of governance and institutional analysis. So this seminar series fits, very, fits in with our mission and it's hosted by uh, my longtime colleague at the University of Pittsburgh, Mike Madison. Mike is a professor in the School of Law and has been instrumental in the technology of law and law and technology um, and is now thinking about what technology might hold for future in law. Mike? Thank you, Martin, and uh, thanks to the Center uh, for agreeing to uh, host and organize this series and uh, let me indulge uh, some of my ideas and instincts about uh, great scholars from around the world uh, who would be wonderful to invite uh, and hear their uh, ideas and thoughts uh, on, uh, on the future of law in a broad sense. Uh, so my role at the University of Pittsburgh School of Law is, uh, in addition to teaching IP and uh, technology subjects, is to uh, organize what we are now calling the Future Law Project, which is a name you may have seen uh, on the invitation. Right now, the Future Law Project is a, a place to convene uh, research and uh, ideas around uh, my work on IP and institutions and governance, and that of my colleague and friend, Kevin Ashley, who is with us today, who is uh, a fantastic scholar and researcher in the area of artificial intelligence and law. Uh, if you'd like to know more about what's happening at Pitt Law in particular and this Future Law Project, please contact either me or Kevin separately uh, at any time. We'd love to talk with you. We are always looking for uh, colleagues and friends and partners in many respects. Uh, so with that, I want to briefly introduce today's speaker, uh, Frank Fagan, uh, before turning the microphone over to him. Frank is uh, an associate professor of law at the EdHEC Business School in Lille uh, in northern France. So uh, he is coming to us from across the Atlantic Ocean. Uh, Frank is a 2013 graduate of the University of Pittsburgh School of Law, where he was the editor-in-chief of the Pitt Law Review. Uh, before coming to Pitt Law, he was a student of law and economics, and he was awarded his PhD in law and economics in 2011 from Erasmus University in Rotterdam. Uh, Frank uh, has been rapidly uh, creating a great record in research and scholarship in law and economics over the last several years. Before teaching at Ed Heck, he was on the faculty for a year at uh, the University of South Australia School of Law, down under. Uh, at some of the work he has co-authored, including the paper he is talking about today, as co-authored with Saul Levmore, who is the former dean of the University of Chicago School of Law. Frank also has quite a number of papers and works uh, solo authored as well. Uh, so Frank will speak for about 25 minutes. And at the conclusion of his presentation, uh, I will step back in and uh, moderate a queue for a uh, question and answer. So with that, welcome, Frank. It's great to have you with us. Please take it away. Thank you, Mike, and thank you for the introduction. Uh, the title of my talk today is Competing Algorithms for Law. And I've heard that this is a uh, very active audience with uh, good questions, so I'm gonna jump right in. And I'll start with an observation that essentially that algorithms have generally been successful over the past years. They've made many moves into many areas of life. And it's easy to see that these improvements were made with relatively large sample sizes. Um, and leading textbook in machine learning, this good fellow citation here, uh, sort of defines what large sample sizes mean for good uh, machine learning. And acceptable performance in supervised machine learning approximates about 5,000 labeled examples per category. Now with unsupervised methods, Goodfellow and his co-authors estimate that we can exceed or match human performance with about 10 million observations. But in law, these sample sizes are much smaller. So for instance, in Wisconsin in 2011, the Department of Corrections there studied the behavior of uh, 
uh, prisoners that were later released and that recidivated. And they found that within a three year period, there were only 2,379 that had recidivated. And of those, if you start thinking about some of these labels, um, only 840 were classified as violent. Uh, 884 were incarcerated for a year or less. Of course, this would be fewer if you classify them as violent. And only 111 were incarcerated for greater than five years and then paroled. So it's easy to see that this is not enough data to achieve even uh, the 5,000 labeled examples that one would need. And if you multiply it by 50, if you assume that people in Wisconsin act more or less the same as those in say Louisiana or perhaps California or maybe in colder climates in Vermont, if you think that these are roughly uh, equal comparisons, uh, you still might not have enough data uh, and you certainly won't have enough data for unsupervised methods. So what this means for law, at least in the sentencing context, is that these algorithms are not purely data driven. There's some theory, uh, and for instance, this Kleinberg paper, which is uh, John Kleinberg and co-authors, which is widely cited as an important paper for sentencing. This was published in the Quarterly Journal of Economics. Uh, Kleinberg and, and co-authors have later been uh, contracted with the state of New York to develop a sentencing algorithm there. Um, they had to develop some theory to determine how to label uh, some of the unlabeled data in the data set, most obviously um, the unobserved counterfactuals. So what would happen for somebody who's imprisoned? How do you assume they would act if they were actually released? Well, we don't know, we don't observe that. So we have to develop some type of theory what Saul and I refer to in the paper as synthetic algorithms. Uh, but in any case, with their synthetic algorithm, uh, John Kleinberg and, and his co-authors shown that these algorithms can do a relatively better job than human judges. By better, we mean that you can release the same number of prisoners and get less recidivism, or perhaps get the same level of recidivism by releasing more prisoners. But there's a common reaction in law that there's some problems with these algorithms, uh, even if you accept that the synthetic approach and, and the theory could be relatively settled on and there wouldn't be much argu argument around these assumptions. So even if we were to accept these algorithms, which it certainly seems that law is doing today, and these algorithms are clearly being used by sentencing courts across the country, and in many states they're even uh, required. Um, but a common reaction is that these algorithms might be dangerous. So for instance, they might use variables related to race or other protected classes. Um, they might make wrong decisions. Uh, they may be inadvertently biased or perhaps overtly biased. And the policy prescription that comes out of a lot of this talk and a lot of this study is one of transparency or disclosure. And I think this is most forcefully or, or perhaps most famously argued by Kathy O'Neill in her book, Weapons of Math Destruction. But there's problems with transparency. Uh, most obviously, algorithms are protected as trade secrets. And uh, this comes out in some of the case law. There's not much case law, but it's growing. I'll focus a little bit on Loomis in a bit. Uh, and the idea, of course, is that if the algorithm is fully disclosed and we know exactly what the algorithm's doing and we can see all of the data, then there would be no incentive to create them. Uh, but what this paper points out, this paper competing algorithms for law, is that if all of the data is uh, available to defendants and if the um, specification of the, of the algorithm is main, uh, made available to defendants, there could also be accuracy problems. And I'll go into exactly how this works and the intuition behind what we call retrofitting. So uh, let me lead with my conclusion up front. What we uh, advocate in the paper is that instead of the state like Wisconsin or these other states that are using algorithms uh, for sentencing, instead of paying for a single algorithm, the state should instead open up a competition. They should divide the data perhaps in half or some proportion and uh, release part of the data to the public who uh, would submit competing algorithms. And these competitors should build their algorithms with the data that's provided by the state. And then it, the competition would be held on the data that's set aside in the state's uh, lockbox, which competitors aren't permitted to see. Uh, 
And uh, we go on to apply this idea to in, in several contexts, including criminal sentencing, university admissions, and employment. So uh, let me talk a little bit about Loomis before I discuss retrofitting in particular. So what happened in Loomis, and this was in the state of Wisconsin, um, the Wisconsin had accused Loomis of participating in a drive-by shooting. He eventually pleaded guilty of two lesser charges and Wisconsin prepared a sentencing report. The Wisconsin Department of Corrections prepared a sentencing report on behalf of the sentencing judge. And this included a proprietary risk assessment that was built by a firm, I believe the firm is um, North Point, and the name of the algorithm was Compass. And Compass uh, had used data, or North Point had used the data to develop Compass that had been given to it by the states about previous recidivist and non-recidivist wrongdoers, their behavior after they had been released. And from what we know, from what we can see, nobody has seen the inner workings of Compass um, in, in uh, trial, but you can see, you can view the questionnaire that's given to the defendant uh, before sentencing. And the questionnaire consists of about 120 questions. And these are social history questions such as um, uh, drug and alcohol addiction history, uh, other social factors like military service, um, some interesting questions were like how many times defendant had moved in the past year um, and, and just various questions about social history and then uh, some questions about the defendant's criminal history and this is all provided to the sentencing judge. What's not provided to the sentencing judge is the actual algorithm or the method of how it was produced and this is not disclosed to either defendant or the court. So what Loomis argued was a classic due process case, in particular for the constitutional law scholars in the room, procedural due process, he argued specifically. And he argued that Wisconsin's reliance on this algorithm takes into account the data of many people, including people outside of Wisconsin. Um, and it, it's aggregating all of this data, all of these 120 variables or perhaps other variables that we don't see uh, about other people's social history, about other people's criminal history. Um, and it, it's coming up with a decision that's really a form of what Loomis called aggregative justice. And he argued that under the 14th Amendment of the Constitution, that he was deprived of his due process because he hadn't received individualized justice. And not only that, but he wanted to look at the algorithm. He wanted to know exactly uh, how North Point and was um, and how the state of Wisconsin using this algorithm compass was uh, sort of understanding his propensity to recidivate in the future on the basis of this aggregate data. And so when the um, court looked at this and this went up to the Wisconsin Supreme Court, it was denied certiorari to the US Supreme Court, but Wisconsin looked at this and it said, compass was just one of many factors that the sentencing judge considered. And because the sentencing judge looked at other factors, including Loomis's individualized criminal history, uh, that his procedural due process had not been violated. And in dicta, it, it sort of set out a, a list of best practices for Wisconsin sentencing judges to follow. And in particular, it highlighted that future sentencing judges should use these algorithms in combination with some type of individualized evaluation of the defendant. And it additionally held that Compass was indeed a trade secret that was protected as such, and Loomis was unable to see. Um, I'll just mention something briefly about equal protection. He didn't, Loomis that is, didn't specifically bring an equal protection claim, uh, but he did try to support his individualized justice claim by uh, asserting that Compass and the sentencing judge had taken sex into account. And so this supported his argument that he was being judged or he was being sentenced uh, on aggregate data as opposed to something that's individual. Uh, the court consistent with its uh, other ruling noted that there was no evidence that the sentencing judge specifically had considered sex. And in any case, it noted in dicta that on average women recidivate less than men so any aggregation 
would have biased Loomis's sentence downwards. He would have been biased. He would have had a lesser sentence if the court had relied on this data. So uh, what, what I want to get into and what really is the heart of this paper is that this is not just a trade secret problem where we're trying to incentivize innovators to develop uh, great and accurate machine learning algorithms that are useful for the state. Um, what we show in the paper is that if all of the data is made available and if the algorithms made it available to defendants, that they can retrofit. They can essentially search for some type of characteristic that they find, that individual characteristic or feature of themselves that somehow tricks the algorithm in making them look better compared to everyone in the data set. So for instance, uh, if I would like to show that I won't recidivate, I can look at all of the data and find some attribute unique to me. So my name is Frank, uh, perhaps everyone with the fifth letter of their name K, which is a rather, I don't know, perhaps unusual fifth letter and a first name. Um, I, I can't really think of other names with the fifth letter K, uh, perhaps, uh, well, in any case, it, it, it's some, a uh, unique attribute to me, potentially unique attribute to me. You can imagine any variable you like here. Maybe the fact that I showed up in court that day with a orange tie as opposed to a red tie. Um, uh, it, I find some characteristic that just happens to work, that, that just somehow shows that I'm different from everyone else. So I, I've somehow, uh, it can predict that I won't recidivate on the basis of this unique feature because, well, quite frankly, the algorithm will be unable to predict whether I'd recidivate if it actually considered that feature. Uh, so if, if I apply, if instead, if I have to apply my trick to data that I haven't seen, it's much more likely that my trick will fail, right? So the classic example, think of, I don't know, the stock market where I'm trying to build an algorithm to predict prices. If I'm using data from 2018 to 2020, it's much more easy for me to find some feature that's going to predict stock prices during that period, but it's not so useful. I should have to find some feature of uh, stocks that predict prices for data that I haven't seen yet somewhere in the future. So data must be hidden from me, not just as a matter of incentives for people to build machine learning algorithms for the state to use, but also to encourage accuracy. So most empirical work quite naturally applies this insight. So out of sample testing, um, even the, the Kleinberg paper that I mentioned before uh, is always applied. It's very careful to set aside data in the lockbox for diagnostic testing. Um, and for some reason, this insight of dividing data and keeping some of it hidden from the algorithm builders, this insight hasn't made it into law or perhaps law and economics more particular Lee, and we're trying to bring that insight to, to bear. And so the idea, of course, is that competition on this hidden data will lead to more accurate algorithms. So let me handle a few um, immediate objections. So imagine if there were no competing algorithms and we follow the transparency policy prescription and we have a fully transparent algorithm and data set for sentencing that I'm able to see. I offer the fifth letter of my name variable, and uh, I show that, hey, you know, because I have this letter K, I'm not going to recidivate. And the state easily responds that, well, even though nobody with the K fifth letter variable recidivates, K is statistically unimportant. And um, when we talk about in prediction, it's a little bit different from causal inference. In predictive inference, we're more concerned with regularization and statistical importance. And there's several techniques, but perhaps the most intuitive one is to measure the mean accuracy of an algorithm with and without a variable. So we might measure the accuracy of the Wisconsin algorithm with uh, the 5L variable and see that the accuracy is just slightly increased. What then? Um, maybe when we include the 5L variable, there's no increase in accuracy at all. But again, if the data set is small, well, the state might just be wrong. So data scientists clearly would insist that retrofitting should never be allowed because the data should be set aside in a lockbox for this type of diagnostic testing. 
But this insight's harder to bring to law because law might insist that allowing variables like 5L or something unique to me is the very nature of our adversarial justice system or it's somehow constitutional. But in any case, the data scientists, we argue in the paper, should be comfortable with our proposition because what competition does is it sharpens these predictive models. Uh, retrofit retrofitting is simply not possible when data is set aside for testing. So I feel like this is something that's comfortable both for law and for data scientists for holding these competitions. Um, another objection might be that, well, what if we overrule my 5L variable with causality? So you can imagine a, a situation where a defendant offers a variable with no predictive significance and say, I don't know, the compass data set. Perhaps uh, Loomis is aged 66, he has a bad back, maybe he's unable to walk more than 20 minutes per day. And the inability to walk 20 minutes per day causes uh, an outcome of no recidivism. Uh, all other attributes of this uh, a defendant who is age 66 and unable to walk predicts recidivism, so the state would insist on incarceration. Well, here it's easy to see that the judge would overrule the algorithm because it's clear that uh, Loomis or, or another defendant in this situation would be unable to commit uh, a crime in the future, if, for instance, a violent crime if this is a violent offender, uh, if they're unable to walk or, or leave their house. Um, and so this is essentially the holding of Loomis, where the judge is considering the algorithm as just one factor. But our point with this respect to uh, this causality point is that even if the state were to offer causal models to overrule this 5L variable or some other unique attribute variable, these types of causal uh, models also benefit from competition. They also benefit from the adversarial justice system, just like predictive models do. And you can think of any sort of diagnostic you like with respect to a causal model, such as uh, a higher R squared or um, a cleaner specification or, or some type of diagnostic that allows you to say one model is better than the other. Um, when I present this paper in Europe, there's always some type of discomfort with the government outsourcing sentencing, uh, a sentencing algorithm or any algorithm to private parties. Uh, and the response that uh, I usually offer is that the government with the input of its citizens sets the penalty. Uh, five years in prison, six years in prison, particular fine, whatever it might be. And the government simply outsources in uh, our proposal variable identification and some algorithm building in order to achieve that objective or that penalty. Um, and it, there's certainly possibilities that a private entity or we could imagine even Loomis offering his own algorithm, uh, he may cheat. He could develop knowledge of that data that's set aside in the state's lockbox uh, by combing through public records and by backward induction somehow developing some type of um, uh, expected value of what's inside of the state's lockbox. Um, but perhaps professional ethics of algorithm builders uh, could, could strain these private entities that would be building these algorithms. And in any case, if the private entity or the private person is cheating, then they wouldn't have a good trade secret claim. And then once that algorithm's opened up, it would be easily outperformed through retrofitting. So uh, let me just turn briefly to uh, admissions and employment um, before concluding. So I think uh, in the paper, what really, the, the main issue that, that tends to come up around university admissions and employment is how to set the goals. Um, in finance, setting algorithmic outcomes is generally straightforward because you uh, can just maximize risk, risk adjusted returns. Uh, but when you're thinking about employment decisions um, or university admissions, there's multiple goals at stake. So diversity, productivity, other strategic goals of the employer can all come into play. Uh, but with competing algorithms, what we have in mind is more of a process than the substance. So the employer or the university can set the parameters of the competition, and then whatever those parameters are, the competitors try to achieve. So for instance, a university might set aside 60% of its seats to the highest SAT score, and then 40% to other goals, or perhaps some other combination. 
uh, can be imagined, but this process of competition, once the goal is set, is more or less the same. Uh, in terms of employment, uh, if there's any employment discrimination attorneys in the, in the virtual room here, I, you can think of the third prong of classic disparate impact cases where um, uh, it, the court asks, is there less discriminatory means of achieving the same result? So if we go back to mean accuracy and how it's computed with the algorithm, so maybe the first algorithm is able to compute 90, uh, achieve a 92.6% accuracy rate with a particular specification uh, that includes a discriminatory variable. Well, of course, if the defendant can offer um, an algorithm without that discriminatory variable and achieve the same result, then that uh, defendant would prevail on the third prong of a disparate impact case. And this comes into play when we think about proxy variables too. Um, so there's a lot of concern that, you know, there's certain variables that are correlated tightly with protected classes like zip code and race, for instance. Uh, clearly employment status uh, could be tied to protected class as well. Um, but again, the state can set the parameters of the competition. So we could imagine a competition that says, all right, let's achieve accuracy with the fewest number of proxy variables, or uh, let's achieve a set level of accuracy and only allow so many proxy variables. So you can imagine many different combinations around this idea of competing algorithms. So let me close out with um, perhaps the area that we're sort of beginning to turn our attention now is what to do after the competition. Uh, because it, once you have a, a competition, um, and you have a winning algorithm, perhaps from the second defendant, then there's another defendant that arrives, the third defendant and the fourth defendant arrives, uh, who is going to compete against that previously uh, successful algorithm, that winning algorithm. And they presumably would have more access to data. And over time, of course, these circumstances will have changed. So eventually the state will need to update the data that's withheld in the lockbox. So, um, we're more or less ambivalent. Uh, we just recognize that it will need to be done and that uh, how often the state will need to update the data will be a function of how quickly the environment changes. So you could imagine, for instance, in a recidivist context, um, perhaps some new technology, new tracking technology, like an ankle bracelet uh, arrives and it's able to track people who are released. So we see uh, recidivism drop even with higher release rates. Um, and so that data will need to be updated over time with environmental change, also with respect to the number of defendants who come and perhaps other factors too. But the main point uh, and what we argue is that even if the state takes a modest step of holding a competition, that this is an advance over current practices like in Wisconsin where they're just simply outsourcing to a single firm. And here's some bibliography. Uh, here's the paper, uh, the very first paper, and then the talk relies on some other work here that I put as well. I uh, look forward to your questions. And of course, uh, feel free to email me anytime. My email address is here as well. Fantastic. Thank you, Frank, so much. Again, uh, for anyone who hasn't seen the paper already, in addition to the fact that there's a draft on SSRN, there's also a draft on the center's website in the uh, schedule for this series. So I will uh, moderate a queue for questions. We have uh, close to 30 minutes uh, for Q&A. Uh, the best thing for people to do if you have a question is just to send me a note in the chat. Just indicate that you would like to ask a question. Uh, you don't need to type out the question in the chat and I will get to people roughly in the order in which I see names pop up in the chat. Um, I have a question first from Kevin Ashley. Kevin. Uh, hi, Frank. It's very nice to chat with you again. And uh, I haven't read the paper, but I enjoyed your talk. Um, it does make me uh, think about uh, work that was done back in the in the 90s. Uh, maybe you weren't born yet, but um, it was by Uri Schilt, who was uh, an Israeli AI and law scientist who used to write about and do work on intelligent computer systems for criminal sentencing. And he came very close to getting the Israeli government to adopt uh, an approach. Uh, 
uh, it did not focus uh, on predicting recidivism. So it wasn't really a machine learning approach, but it was a sort of case-based approach. Uh, the idea was um, that the, the system would be an environment that the judge could uh, address, could see um, past cases uh, involving similar fact situations and could um, see where her decision fit in with uh, past decisions that were similar. Uh, so for example, uh, it might focus on similar uh, fact situations, similar features and focus on uh, those similar cases that had a different result and uh, help the judge to inquire, well, why is it different? And then see whether those features that explain the difference related to individualized information that uh, the judge had about this particular defendant. Uh, it always struck me as a helpful uh, suggestion. It, it was a, a computer, it was an AI system that was not making a decision and it was not recommending a decision, rather it was helping the judge see how her decision would fit in and whether it was an outlier and so forth. Um, and so it, you, you've thought a lot about the new algorithms and so forth um, and I, I just uh, want to get your take on that and perhaps um, whether you think that would have been a good idea to pursue. Yeah, thank you. Um, it's nice to see you too, Kevin. I, I, my feeling, you know, this reminds me, I, my biggest complaint with the Kleinberg paper, which is a brilliant paper, but, you know, I, there's a lot of excitement and enthusiasm around the Kleinberg paper because the idea is that the algorithm outperforms the judge. But if you think about it, the way that that paper set up is an unfair competition because what it does is the algorithm is provided with a history of the quality of its past decisions. The judge doesn't get to see previous data, what had happened with particular uh, people who had uh, been released with particular features. And I think if the judge were armed with say, I don't know, a simple spreadsheet that showed various features of the person um, in a list of uh, people who had been released and how they had um, behaved later on down the road, and they were able to compare that, much like you're suggesting is uh, what Uri Schultz was doing, uh, it, compared to the individual in front of that judge, then, then I think we're approaching something um, where it's more of a combination of both uh, the algorithms, um, let's say competitive advantages and the human judges competitive advantages. And it's more of a synthesis. Yeah. And in fact, I, Saul and I think that this is the path that law is going to take in the near future. Uh, and we discussed this in detail uh, in this fifth paper down, the impact of artificial intelligence on rules, standards, and judicial discretion. Mm -hmm. And the idea there is that in certain situations that are very straightforward, like a very basic rule, uh, you could imagine all of the parameters and you could perfectly model the situation, then there, surely the machine has some type of competitive advantage. But in areas where there's, uh, where law functions more like a standard, where there's more discretion for, um, uh, I don't know, I guess, environmental change, that, uh, that there's certainly some advantages for having uh, the judge work in concert with the algorithm. So I, my reaction is twofold. One, that I think I would agree that, um, you know, that approach makes sense uh, because it, it especially makes sense when environments are fast changing. Um, it especially makes sense when we're seeing technological advances in tracking of prisoner or of, uh, released um, parolees over time. Um, and it certainly makes sense uh, in as much as, as all of the environmental features of what the algorithm was modeled in have are, are no longer um, uh, consistent with present day reality. So in a, to the extent that things have changed, uh, it makes sense to have more human input. Um, and the, the second area where I agree with that approach is that, you know, I, it's, it's very clear to me that um, 
in the Kleinberg paper that the algorithm performed well because the algorithm simply had more data than the judge. So I think we should arm our judges with uh, data. And, and I think this also calls into a question how we are training lawyers today. Um, they need to have some type of uh, statistical um, uh, tools that they can bring to bear to be able to interpret these types of things that they're beginning to see. That's a, a perfect segue to the next question because it comes from a member of Pitt's Department of Statistics, uh, Lucas Fench. Thanks, Michael. Hi, Frank. Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm an assistant professor in the stats department. Um, my, my work is kind of at the intersection of statistics and machine learning, so I'm, I'm really interested in this kind of uh, application. I had kind of a, a two-part question. Um, that I was curious to get your thoughts on. So um, I guess to start, uh, when you uh, were discussing these algorithms, you sort of presented this from the standpoint of um, having access to an algorithm. And if we had access to this algorithm, we could sort of see what's going on. Um, I, I would wanna quibble with that a little bit because I think just having access to an algorithm doesn't mean that you necessarily understand what's going on underneath you know, all the hidden layers. Um, a lot of my research, for example, is, is basically trying to um, you know, look at algorithms that are already capable of fitting well and trying to pull out of them what statistically meaningful uh, things you can actually garner. Uh, and then on top of that, sort of as, as a part two to that question, um, if you do have this um, really accurate algorithm that's a function of, let's say hundreds of different predictors, there's almost certainly going to be a bunch of other algorithms sort of nearby that generate predictions that are almost as accurate, but sometimes give contradictory information. And I wonder how, just your thoughts on sort of that, that general. Yeah, uh, I, I think, um, you know, I, there's a, a, a startup that I've been um, spending some time with here. Uh, it's actually based in Portugal. And their business model is to um, sort of help companies understand exactly what their algorithms are doing and what variables they're using so that they can help them regularize to save costs on data collection. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, my, my response to this is that, yeah, we can sort of throw our hands up in the air and say that even if we can see the algorithm, it's not going to be enough. Um, but you get to keep in mind that defendant has access to experts. Um, already a lot of private foundations are building these algorithms. They're, they're funding uh, the creation of these algorithms uh, that are being used by the state for sentencing and for other decisions. Um, so I, I think that if we, if we want to know uh, what the algorithm is doing and why, uh, that we can come up with some reasons um, but keep in mind that the, what we're advocating, we don't even have to know those reasons, okay? Because all we're looking for under our framework, what we're proposing with competing algorithms is an algorithm that outperforms another algorithm on the state's lockbox data. So we're not suggesting that these algorithms should be opened up at all. On the contrary, we're saying it's perfectly fine to keep them as trade secrets. All we're saying is, is that if algorithm number one is more accurate than algorithm number two on the set aside data that is uh, being used by the state to hold the competition, then that's the algorithm that the state should choose and, and use. Um, so that, that sort of ties into your second point about contradictory results. Um, because you could imagine two algorithms that, like you say, maybe, uh, you know, they share a lot of similar uh, characteristics with how they're specified and they generate contradictory results. Um, but again, they would have to, in, in how we're imagining this competition, they would be generating contradictory results on the same data that's been set aside by the state. So if whichever is performing best on the lockbox data is the winning algorithm. So if contradictory results is exactly what we want, right? If algorithm one is contradicting algorithm two, that's great because we can say that algorithm one is more accurate than algorithm two, or if it's the other way around, that's fine too. But what we're looking for is to maximize accuracy of this algorithm. Yeah, I guess I, 
so I don't want to take too much time, but I, I would just quickly <laughs> respond to that by saying, I mean, there's nothing particularly magical about one particular test set, one sort of lockbox of data like you're describing, right? Like I, me as a statistician, I hear that and I think, sure, but it's it, it might be more accurate on this specific test set, but it's not statistically more accurate. It's not meaningfully more accurate. I mean, I could see, you know, an entire sort of cottage industry just developing around companies who would develop machine learning algorithms that were capable of predicting that their defendant wasn't a high risk and still maintained accuracy sort of within epsilon of, of whatever the state standard was. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. And, and I, I don't see this as contradicting our framework, right? I mean, it, that's exactly what we're combating. Um, you know, if, if your defendant is high risk, then that should show up on the winning algorithm. So why don't, why don't we take another question and, and maybe we can come back to that conversation with Lucas. Uh, next up, uh, George Williams. Uh, I just want to uh, credit George. Uh, George is a, a student at Pitt Law and one of the a great uh, students in our technology law area. And uh, one of the things I was hoping to accomplish with this series this spring was a way to bring uh, law students as well as uh, grad students and doctoral students around the university into these scholarly research conversations about law technology. So um, thanks to George and other students who may be in the group today uh, for attending. And uh, George, over to you for your question. Uh, thank you, Professor Madison. Um, I've really enjoyed the lecture. This is really cool. Um, and some exposure to like the cool technologies going on behind the scenes and how it's affecting uh, the legal world and hopefully um, putting us closer to being more up to date. I know sometimes the profession is behind. So anyways, um, I did have a question that's less technical, more policy related in that um, I was wondering if you could explain maybe how this potentially could shift burdens on the burden onto um, the defendants or people who aren't necessarily best situated to handle, um, you know, uh, someone not positioned to deal with, um, disputes relating to algorithms, especially if, if you have someone who is using, um, you know, a public defender and um, access te to technology. Um, I wanted to see how you thought this affected it and if it created maybe a pay, uh, a pay to play or pay to win kind of model where people have more access to finances or better able to defend against, um, you know, uh, AI technology or, or something along those lines. Sure, uh, George, that's exactly what we're trying to, to combat. Uh, it, the idea is that more competition is going to provide that defendant who might not have the resources to, to defend herself with the ability to uh, know that the algorithm that's being used is the most accurate out there. And she's going to piggyback on the competitive efforts of all of the competitive entrants in that competition. So it's, um, you know, it's just like anything else where you imagine competition, like uh, maybe you can't afford to um, uh, develop your own private uh, uh, cell phone. I know I certainly can't, but I benefit from all of uh, the competitive efforts of, of iPhone or of Apple of, um, well, I guess in France, we have Huawei. I don't know if you have that in the United States, but you know, you have all of these cell phone developers who I, through competition, develop this device that becomes uh, accessible to me. And this is the same concept conceptually with these algorithms, which are indeed can be very expensive to develop. Um, but we imagine situations, like I mentioned before, where there's private foundations that are already funding the use of these algorithms. Uh, it's the state. Re remember what we're comparing it against, right? It's the state that's actually purchasing this algorithm or a license to use it. Um, from private developers like North Point, the developer of the Compass algorithm. And uh, so instead of the state just simply purchasing one algorithm, um, we're suggesting that the state hold a competition amongst algorithm developers so that defendants can have access to the most accurate algorithm. Mike, you're, my, you're muted. On. Uh, there's a question in the chat. Uh, I don't know, Brett, 
Brent Mallon, if you wanted to, to ask the question uh, to the to the group out loud. Oh, sure. I guess I can. And I, I guess I was just curious about like um, if so in the process you're imagining of evaluating algorithms. So if there would be a way to evaluate them in addition to their their effectiveness, I guess. So I, I was imagining something like um, what if both algorithms that we're imagining, uh, you know, maybe one's more accurate, but both of them for instance, um, disproportionately judge African-Americans as having high rates of recidivism. Would there be a part in the process that would be evaluating that also, or and how would that happen? Yeah, that, that's what I was mentioning when I said it's up to the state to set the parameters of the competition. So the state sets the goals, whatever we want those goals to be, and then the competitors try to achieve those goals the best, the most accurate way that they can. Uh, so, Sure. Um, I, to your point directly, one of the big challenges right now is uh, what exactly should we be doing? We, as a policy question, what should we be doing with what um, we might term proxy variables, right? So variables like zip code that can stand in for race, variables like uh, employment status um, that are correlated with race. So what do we do with these proxies? Well, we could very easily imagine, Brent, a competition where you the, the state simply says, all right, we want to achieve a, uh, a threshold level of accuracy. Like say we want to achieve 90% accuracy in predicting recidivism and whoever can achieve 90% accuracy with the fewest number of proxy variables is the winner. We'll declare that algorithm the winner. So you can compete on all of these different types of parameters that we set with law. Yeah. Thank you. So, so not seeing any more questions in the in the chat, I'm going to have a to take the chance to, to ask one of my own, uh, which is, um, is there is there is there anything that's distinctive about law, uh, sort of the content of law, legal principles, legal standards, uh, that suggests a, a different treatment in this sort of institutional dynamic relative to say sort of ordinary government procurement, right? So as I'm reading the paper and I'm listening to your discussion, I'm, I'm thinking to myself, I'm always thinking of analogies and, and existing precedent. And the one that comes immediately to mind is government procurement, right? So if the, if the defense department wants a tank, uh, the defense can, department can simply build itself a tank if it wanted to go into the business of producing tanks or it outsources. And of course the standard is to outsource to private contractors and the standard practice uh, for sort of anti-corruption reasons is to uh, go through a sort of a public procurement process, government standards, specifications, bidding, and so forth, where there's a set of, there's a system in place uh, for accountability, transparency, and, and, and adjudicating uh, the, the prevailing bid. And in many respects, what you're describing for law is, is sort of a somewhat analogous uh, sort of publicly supervised, but market-driven uh, production process uh, for algorithms uh, that sort of sets off to the side sort of the ultimate question of how one decides uh, what the prevailing algorithm should be. Uh, but the, the presumption in the first place is that some kind of market competition is likely to, over time to produce some sense of better results. Um, is law like a tank or, or is law sort of distinctive and special in some respects that we should imagine how law is insourced or outsourced in ways that's different than how we imagine buying tanks? Yeah, that's a great question. Thanks, Mike. Um, I, what immediately comes to mind is that there is a key difference that I could imagine very easily plaintiffs and defendants arguing over which is whether or not the data in the lockbox is stale. So if you take the public procurement uh, example, you could imagine that the government's gonna determine if it needs a new tank or a new type of tank, if it wants to upgrade the tank, um, maybe through its own assessment of you know, the geopolitical situation or various advances by uh, competitor countries and their technology, it says, okay, we need new tanks, we need new planes. Uh, maybe there's interest group pressures. Well, clearly there is interest group pressures here, right? Um, but I think with, at least when, when law is trying to um, uh, allocate rights 
So the right uh, to, to be um, free uh, from having to sit in prison. Uh, the, one of the key uh, components of that argument is that it's not the government that's going to decide to make the update to the quality of the data it, the same way that it would for updating the quality of the tank. So the plaintiff and the defendant, so the, the state and the defendant in the sentencing question, they could potentially argue, be arguing over whether or not the, uh, the newer data should apply for determining the uh, accuracy of the algorithm or whether or not the, the data set in the government's lockbox already is still good or is somehow still indicative of the environmental situation. So for example, um, let me try to clarify it with an example, like um, uh, I'll try to use soccer, right? <laughs> so, you know, you're, you're, on the, you're on the field and there's like, um, you know, you're, you're arguing over whether or not uh, some penalty has happened. And uh, uh, the, and the arguments based on all of this data that's accumulated over, say, um, the first era of the way soccer was played. I don't know, I'm not a soccer connoisseur like you are, Mike, but maybe like the golden age was between the 50s and the 80s. So you have all this accumulated data between 1950s and 1980s soccer, um, which is obviously stale for soccer that's happening in 2010. So if I'm trying to like argue to FIFA that the rule should be updated or that the data that they're using to assess my predictive quality around the rule should be updated, uh, they're going to say, no, the 50s, 80s data is perfectly fine for prediction here. Whereas I'm going to say, no, no, we need to use new data to update. And, uh, and I think that there's this inherent tension between adversarial parties about the quality of the data that's being used out for out of sample testing that is not the same for uh, government procurement. That would, uh, otherwise, I think that they, they share quite a few similarities. Uh, but that's how I would differentiate them, is this argument over the, uh, what's actually sitting in the lockbox. Interesting. Uh, any other follow-up questions uh, for Frank before we, uh, before we call an end to today's seminar? So uh, Frank, I wanna, on behalf of the center and our, the Pitt Law School uh, and everyone who was able to attend today, I wanna thank you uh, for being the inaugural uh, speaker uh, in our Future of Law workshop series this spring. Uh, I love the fact that we were able to take advantage of living in a pandemic-based Zoom world and bring you back to Pittsburgh from, from uh, Northern France. So uh, round of applause uh, for a very, very provocative and engaging presentation and uh, look forward to encouraging uh, uh, you know, connecting with you on an ongoing basis and uh, in the life of the center and the law school and uh, best of luck with this paper and, uh, and your future research.